So let's talk a little bit about uh, the insecticide seed treatments. And uh, as most of us know by now, the, the companies pretty well put a seed treatment on, on every bag of seed they sell. So the nice thing is we're seeing some nice benefits from these seed treatments against the sugarcane aphid. And that's this is our early season protection. We're getting about uh, anywhere from uh, 30 to up to 45 days of protection against those early season infestations. And this is something that's going to be extremely important in the south uh, where we see these big overwintering yeah. populations that come in early. This is sure going to prevent some early season damage. Yeah, you're definitely looking at infestation and, and pressure from sugarcane aphid right out of the ground. And seedlings are at serious risk for it. Uh, high plains, uh, for sure, this year, at least, we're looking at them moving in. So uh, uh, in, in the high plains, it's actually on sorghum more common uh, to find the seed uh, tr already pre-treated. Right. Uh, it, it's harder to find uh, seed that's not treated with these insecticides. Uh, and it can be very, very important, say, if we're following a failed cotton planting. Uh, I think the seed treatments, we need to be sure that they're on there for something that's planted late Absolutely. when it would be more at risk for the sugarcane aphid to come in. And I think for our clients down south and, and our agents down south that are planting a lot of uh, forage sorghums and hay grazers, those may not necessarily be treated, and I don't think we could just uh, take for granted that there's going to be a seed treatment on all the seeds. So for our forage sorghums, it's going to be pretty important that they talk to their seed supplier and mm -hmm. make sure that the mm -hmm. seed is treated. If it's not treated, they can get that seed treated, and uh, ju just need to talk to their, their seed supplier to get that information. Yeah, just be sure, even on the hay crops, or especially the hay crops, that it is treated. For uh, these, these uh, soil applied insecticides, that's going to be something of a foreign language on the high plains to sorghum producers. Uh, and so folks that aren't familiar with it, that thymet is uh, the old, uh, uh, basically, competition for Timic in cotton back in the day. Is, is what we're looking at as seed boxes, uh, the second boxes mm -hmm. of the chemical going into the ground. And so we'll have to let the research catch up before we recommend soil implied insecticides. Yes. Right, exactly. Well, what about, what about the foliar, since that's what we really rely on when we start reaching threshold? Yeah. So we, uh, I think that if you're a sorghum producer, you've probably heard of Transform, if you're a sorghum producer in Texas anyways. And that's that's the, uh, the product that was used last year and provided very, very good control against sugarcane aphid. Of course, it doesn't have a full label for sorghum and sugarcane, so sugarcane aphids, so we're depending on uh, Section 18 for this particular product. Which we have again. Yes, and we do have that again. That's a good good point. And, and keep in mind that the label rate is three quarters of an ounce to an ounce and a half per acre, but it's very important that our growers understand that they have a maximum of two applications, in-season applications, and that's it. So whether they're using three quarters of an ounce or an ounce and a half, they could apply that two times in the season, and that's that's it. Um, what we're recommending is a one ounce rate, and of course, if you use that one ounce rate, keep in mind that's uh, two applications through the season. The uh, pre-harvest interval for transform for grain sorghum is 14 days, and for forages, it's seven days. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Savanto is a, a new product coming out from Bear Crop Science this year. Uh, we're looking at a uh, rate of four to seven ounces with uh, this one. It has a, uh, like I say, a full label, a 21 day pre-harvest interval and seven day on the forage. As I uh, look at these rates and, and, uh, and things, I can say the most uh, expensive treatment you can make is the one that doesn't work because you have to retreat it again. Right. So I would strongly suggest that we look at the, the higher rates, uh, minimal our suggestions, <laughs> because we don't want to have to come back and, and hit them again. But that can be pretty pricey um, and a tough sell to producers, uh, Robert. That's, and that's right, Blaine. We, we know that a lot of the, the tests that were done last year with Savanto uh, were looking at 8 ounces per acre instead of the 4 to 7 ounce rate. There have been a number of tests at five ounces that have shown good efficacy, but uh, but there's been you know the, the company feels uh, pretty confident with that rate, and I would feel more comfortable if a grower would use a five to six ounce rate if he's going to try to go with the reduced rate, 
and it's going to be it is going to be a little more pricey but the other thing that you got to keep in mind is if we rely on one chemistry too much and we apply that over and over again we will see resistance and we lose that product and then we're forced to use right. the alternative product and uh, we certainly don't want to do that it's uh, certainly a serious risk with this aphid Just remember when we're talking the biology it's given live birth to two live young that are genetic clones of itself mm -hmm, at right. five days of age so if one survives your population in the blink of an eye is now 100 percent resistant so yeah you, could, you definitely want to clean them up to begin with yeah you could easily lose one of these products in a single season if it's abused uh there's a couple other products listed on here that are neonicotinoids in the green it's a uh, indigo and centric both are syngenta products indigo is a premix of lambda cyhalothrin and thiamethoxam lambda cyhalothrin you're probably familiar with is warrior and uh, thiamethoxam is the same product or same active ingredient in centric and also the cruiser c treatment uh, neither of these products are labeled for sorghum or sugarcane aphid so we can't you know it's not something you'll go out and recommend but the research that's been done so far it looks very promising for both these products uh, we do know that that syngenta is pursuing a label right now on sorghum and sugarcane aphid for centric and that'll be the first product that they'll try to move forward with uh, of course it's all going to be dependent on the epa and what the epa says about these new ne neonicotinoids yeah. so yeah, blaine I mean, you want to talk about the products in bloom well, we'll start off there. Uh, we've got Intruder. Of course, it's not labeled. Now, uh, Robert did a lot of the research, so I'm going to lean on him a little bit. Uh, fairly spotty control, uh, not very solid is, uh, is kind of what we're looking at. Put it over into that column. Uh, Cliforus, that's basically Lord's Band or generic variants thereof, which uh, very spotty control as well, not very standard. Uh, work one place not well in another and you're also looking at taking out those predators mm -hmm. uh, all the products on the left are very predator friendly I mean that you can make an application they target the aphid where the beneficials are still there whereas uh, Lord's Band uh, will we'll take out quite a few dimethoate uh, right below that uh, also inconsistent control uh, uh, limited even when it I think it did work in your trials and it smokes a lot of the predators we'll go ahead and take those out Malathon uh, can be the same way and not very consistent control but we're looking at a seven day PHI and, uh, I think Pat might uh, can say that's a consideration when uh, we're looking at uh, defoliating the field to try to go ahead and get it out and get it ready to harvest and, and, and uh, get get it in the bin so we're not worrying about these guys anymore is a say a spray a product like roundup for defoliation um well it'll take a while for that roundup to work and the last thing that's still green on that plant is the head and that's where the aphids move right in the way of the combine to cause all the problems that it does there so this malathion can knock them out of the head uh with your uh, with your defoliant, defoliant. And, that, and you bring up a lot of good points there blaine and i think that uh, when we talk about these products on the right it's just like Blaine said, they aren't as consistent as our neonicotinoids, are, which are the products in green on the left side of this slide. Keep in mind that chlorpyrifos uh, does have, it's like Blaine said, we, we're more familiar with this product as Lorsban, but it does have a generic formulation called Nufos, and you'll see that uh, every now and then in some of the, the insecticide trials. Now, also keep in mind that the one pint rate really was very inconsistent in a number of trials but when we looked at that one quart rate we were seeing better control on the sugarcane aphid but uh, there's a 60 day pre-harvest interval with that that one quart rate so it's it's might be a really good option early in the season as we're getting as it's heading out if we have midge is issues or maybe some uh, headworm issues that might be a good option to to get away keep away from, from the pyrethroids which we know are very hard on the beneficials yeah, absolutely. and keep keep uh, some of those uh, resurgence issues at bay well, let's uh, talk about this this uh, this is basically a figure showing an insecticide trial that was conducted in Corpus Christi this past year and what we're looking at is the percent control on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis are the different products and the bar groupings represent the days after treatment that uh, the valuations were made. So if we start to the left, looking at the red bars, 
that represents three days after treatment, followed by the blue bars at seven days after treatment, and then the green bars representing 14 days after treatment. And essentially what this particular uh, test showed was that our neonicotinoids, which is the Svanto, the Transform, and Indigo, showed really good efficacy against the sugarcane aphid even early in the season. We're seeing good knockdown at three days after treatment, uh, whereas the chlorpyrifos and dimethoate were a little more inconsistent, especially at seven and 14 days after treatment. Uh, if you look at this particular test, we're looking at chlorpyrifos at one pint per acre. By the, uh, by the 14th day, there's no difference between the populations with chlorpyrifos and the untreated checks. So we lost completely all our efficacy at that point in time and uh, the dimethyl weight was diminishing in its uh, performance as well. And keep in mind, if your client is paying for treatment, 50% control is not going to be good enough. He's really looking for something in that 90, 95, 100% control. And we really want to get as good a control with this aphid as possible, mainly because the fact that it does reproduce so quickly. So one way to think about that is you want to perform a population reset. And you right. want to reset it back to as few of aphids as possible. Absolutely. Buy exactly. More Buys more time. That's a good point. Application. Uh, you know, coverage is going to be absolutely critical with the, these products. Uh, we're talking about a aphid that likes to build up in the lower plant part of the plant, and we've got to get product down into control them. Uh, you know, we're looking at 10 gallons by ground, and that would be preferred. Uh, I think uh, most places, uh, especially in the high plains, by the time the sorghum is headed out, we're not looking at a ground application. We're looking at by air, and that's five gallons per acre uh, minimum to get this product moved down. Uh, and uh, for, for those out there that might be uh, talking with the aerial applicators, it's not two and a half one way and two and a half the other way. <laughs> That is five gallons in one pass for that to really work the way we need it to. That's one drop getting down in there as best we can uh, at those rates. Um, and because we're not recommending the low rate on any of the, the products, uh, we don't have a whole lot of data on Savanto at four ounces, uh, Robert. Right. Yeah, that's right, Blaine. And you make some good points. And I was talking to a farmer last week about, uh, about this very same thing about coverage and the importance of coverage. And the comment he made to me was, water is cheap. And I know that if you're making an aerial application that the guy's paying for fuel, but with our ground applications, uh, it makes no sense not to go with the higher vo found volumes and get the good coverage. It is more work. It is tanking up more often, going back to the barn or the well, wherever you're mixing your product at. It is a lot more labor involved. But... The, like I say again, the most expensive treatment is the one that didn't work that exactly. you have to clean up again. And economics is the bottom line on any of these treatments. And we talked about the rates, and, and Blaine was talking about the rates. And with Transform, our recommendation is the one ounce rate. Uh, it's very consistent across a number of different states and a number of different efficacy trials against the sugarcane aphids. So this has been a very solid performing product at this rate. With Savanto, like we said earlier, uh, most of the tests that we've looked at last year were at the 8-ounce rate, so we're cutting that rate in half. We don't have a lot of information on the 4-ounce rate yet. It is unproven. Uh, there have been some tests that have looked at 5-ounce rates, and they have looked very good, but we really don't know uh, how, how that affects the residual properties of the product. And when we move that down even lower into that 4-ounce rate, we really don't have a lot of information as far as the, the total efficacy how consistent that rate's going to be or how that's going to affect the residual properties of the product as well. Also, uh, when we're talking these rates and, and work, uh, it's a lot of really good work down at Corpus, but uh, those of us in the High Plains might know that it's a drier environment up here. We may not uh, get the same level of control Absolutely. at those rates, and we don't have that data yet. This summer, uh, Pat and I, uh, we should be doing some efficacy trials with these different rates to see how they work on the high plains because many times it is just a different size range. Absolutely. Yep. So um, uh, we'll be looking at that, and that's that's another reason I certainly would stay away from the, the lower rates, uh, especially on the high plains if you need to treat. And, and the other nice thing about these two products, and you said this earlier, Lane, is the fact that they are very easy 
on our non-target so the, they're very safe on our beneficials so both products are, are really a good option for our, our customers and our clients okay let's talk about some of the observations not everything's positive uh, we, there are some things that we that have been concerned with these products as well and with transform there were some uh, observations last year where there were failures with this particular insecticide and most particularly when they were mixed with pyrethroids and again we talk about the fact these pyrethroids are very hard on the beneficials and if we don't get everything out there with that first application and we leave some aphids behind and we put a product in like a pyrethroid and we wipe out all the beneficials then uh, that pest population can resurge uh, much faster right much faster there's nothing to keep those populations down and uh, this was more frequent during periods of uh, cooler temperatures or when they were uh, spraying very heavy populations and there was honeydew and sooty mold on the accumulations so what we're seeing is these we talked about this in the first part but when we get this very heavy accumulation of honeydew and on top of that we have the sooty mold it does affect the way that uh, insecticide moves onto the plant and uh, gets to the aphids so really again that just reinforces the need to go out there early scout and spray these uh, these aphids when we hit that uh, that threshold that magic number that we're going to talk about in just a minute I, uh, I do see an uh, issue with the COC crop oil concentrate or, or some of the adjuvants, uh, uh, some observations there. Robert, any experience with that? I have uh, no personal experience with it, and we really aren't sure what type of crop oil concentration was causing those issues, but uh, this was some stuff that, that was seen in, uh, seen in Louisiana. So if you're going to add something, the, the NISs are nice yeah. and there's might, other options it might be tempting because often we will use some crop oil to try to draw it down mm -hmm. into uh, the canopy uh, might be an option there but nis it seems like it's working pretty well for you yeah okay yeah. so uh savanto it does have a long phi it's 21 days so if you're harvesting for grain now this is this is the harvest for grain 21 days so if you're going out there with your uh with your harvest aid, and, uh, this is probably not something you'd want to tank mix with your harvest aid. There's just that, that uh, pre-harvest interval is just too long. The cost is also going to be a consideration. It's going to be a little more expensive than uh, Transform. So because that cost per ounce, to, it's going to be right around two and a quarter an ounce, guys are going to be more tempted to go with that lower rate. And personally, for this year, I'd much feel a little bit better if they were going with a five ounce rate. But I know the price conscious guys are going to be looking at that four ounce rate to keep that cost similar to uh, Transform. Of course, uh, there's a lot more data that's needed. We'll have that data by the end of the year that we can share in the fall. But right now, we just aren't real comfortable with that four ounce rate. But keep in mind, we talked about this earlier. If we depend on one product too much, we put a lot of pressure on that population for resistance. Mm -hmm. So we got to keep those chemistries mixed up as much as possible. And when you're talking to your clientele, just uh, make sure you tell them that the importance of using Savanto, mixing these chem chemistries, is to keep the the, uh, the the possibility of having a resistance issue as low as possible. Now, you'll notice chlorpyrifos is on here. We talked about that one quart rate. It uh, may improve control. There's some data that shows that uh, two pints is offering good sugarcane aphid suppression. But keep in mind that there's a 60-day PHI with that. Now, one thing that a guy may think about uh, as an option is using one pint of chlorpyrifos and one pint of dimethoate uh, may have that potential same potential of knocking those aphid populations down but it keeps that ph at 30 yeah. days there is the risk of the uh, beneficial detriment there yeah. but when, when i see uh off the top of my head that uh, uh that rate on the bottom there um that might be an option for controlling our sorghum midge and giving a little bit of a knock to the sugar cane aphid as well that would be a nice option Speaking of those guys, <laughs> so what are we going to do when we have to treat for midge? Uh, I'll go ahead and jump out and say this for the high plains, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Sorghum midge, they also immigrate to our area every year. And for the Plainview area, if your sorghum has bloomed before August 4th, 9 out of 10 years, you're going to avoid problems with sorghum midge even if they move into the area because they only attack the plant when they're blooming. So there's a little IPM tidbit. If you can manage your days to bloom and planting date to get ahead of the sorghum midge, you could possibly avoid a spray altogether. Now, that's not an option for you guys, though. That's some good good points, uh, Blaine. And even for our guys down South Texas, we know that if we plant early, we can avoid some of those issues with midge as well. So planting early is usually what uh, our sorghum producers down south strive to do. But this year has been very wet for us, and we haven't had that same opportunity to get those early uh, plant dates. So we're a lot of our sorghum producers are planting later this year. So more than likely, we're going to see more midge issues this year than we have in the past not only midge, but also the headworms. But for the midge itself, uh, chlorpyrifos, again, at that one ounce quart, or that one quart rate, uh, does appear to be giving us some benefit as far as suppressing the sugar cane aphid as well. Lanate is an option, but uh, the, the suppression, sugar cane aphid suppression, has been very uh, inconsistent with lanate. And the other issue with lanate is it does. Uh, it is very hard on the beneficials as well. So not very good on the aphid, very hard on the beneficials. That sounds a lot like uh, the, the pyrethroid story we were telling just a minute ago. Spinosin, also better known as Blackhawk, is also offering some midge suppression. It's not labeled for midge, but it has shown some decent activity. Okay, our headworms or this is also the bull worm or corn earworm whatever you want to call it with the addition of the fall army worm uh, you definitely do not want to have a, a pyrethroid if sugarcane aphids are in the mix uh, now the headworms uh, being up that high are usually pretty easy to control if they're harder control in cotton they're easy in sorghum because that head's exposed to the spray it's right there uh, but what, if you have the fall army worm or the sugar cane aphid in the mix that we definitely need to look at some of the Prevathon belt type products. Uh, you know, the Prevathon, it's going to be very easy on the predators as well. It's going to take out those worms without uh, taking out near the uh, beneficials. Um, Absolutely. So that's, uh, I think that's a direction to go and that's fairly easy. The products are out there. They're proven to work. There's a lot of good work on them. Uh, they're done. There usually comes with a little higher price, but it's not uh, out of the range of, of being very good benefit. And, and you're right, Blaine. There's always some pushback when they think about price. But uh, they've got to think about the, the other side of that, too. If they're spraying something a little more, a little, a little harder on the beneficials, they may be looking at a, an additional application for yeah. sure cane aphid later in the season. Yeah. So Which is these, more costly. Uh, more costly, absolutely. And it's it's not on our slide, but we can also talk <clears throat> about the sugar or the uh, spider mites in case they do get into absolutely. sorghum as well. We have mm -hmm. uh, products that are labeled in sorghum. They're also labeled in corn. They uh, work very well. Uh, we proven it last year in a trial we, we did. No, Very so. good. Now, what about when we get close to harvest? The question is, where we're using harvest aids, what can we do to keep the, if we have sugarcane aphid in our sorghum close to harvest, how are we managing those and keeping that PHI as low as possible? And uh, malathion is a nice option, and we talked about that. We are seeing good, fairly decent control. We're, we're seeing good knockdown, even with that point, point uh, that one pint rate. And that, that uh, PHI is seven days. So we could keep those aphids at a minimum with the malathion application. We're applying glyphosate as our harvest aid. And uh, we can keep those aphids out of the head or at least the populations down to a point where they're not causing issues with uh, harvest. Seems like a product that can just knock them back just long enough. Yeah, absolutely, without uh, interfering with your normal harvest operations.